Hi, Andrew. Welcome to the Customer Experience Podcast. Nice to see you. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for being my first in-person well, guest today. I know. It's a, it's a bit of a treat, right? In terms of <laughs> at least having some face-to-face -face conversations, exactly, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So our topic this afternoon is going to be centred around bringing purpose mm. uh, to life in the digital age. Mm -hmm. um, so I really wanted to talk to you about how we overcome the challenge mm -hmm of those that really benefit from digitalization versus mm -hmm. those that, that don't. Um, and for example, customers that don't have access to the internet, mm -hmm. they can't access kind of information communication through technology, effectively, you know, at a disadvantage. So let's start off today by, you know, you introducing yourself to mm -hmm. our listeners. So tell us a little bit about yourself mm -hmm. um, and why you're so passionate about customer experience and driving kind of growth through customers. Well, I've sort of been leading customer experience transformation probably for the last 15 years uh, in various brands, financial services, utilities, healthcare. Um, and I'm really passionate around how does a customer make a difference to really driving what I would say is sustainable customer organic growth. I think you can't achieve organic growth if you haven't got to focus on your customers. You know, if customers don't like doing business with you, they actually leave you. If customers actually like doing business with you, they'll go away and tell their friends and come back for more. So I'm really uh, passionate around how we support customers driving advocacy and loyalty uh, across their business, really. Yeah, okay, fantastic, snap. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we talk about kind of purpose. So how do you go about bringing kind of brand and purpose together in terms of driving a great customer experience? Well, I think, um, a lot of companies now talk about purpose as a new buzzword, uh, I would say, uh, but much more important about having a nice glossy phrase which puts in a wall or you communicate internally and externally is how you bring that purpose to life for customers, for partners, uh, for your people. Uh, so really it's about the actions and things you put in place to bring that purpose into everyday business life. I think the first thing um, is making that purpose resonate with every person in the organization and know how they connect to that uh, in the organization in terms of every person's job. I think, you know, um, people need to know how they feel connected to the brand, how they feel connected personally to the purpose in terms of what they do and contribute to the organization. I think that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing I would say is about communication, right? So how do you ensure that communication is um, positioned in every conversation? From the top of the organization and reinforced i would say in terms of daily daily work i think there's been interesting i, I just recall a couple of brands as examples here i remember being part of a ritz carlton stand-up uh, with their team where we talked around the values and purpose of the organization uh, and very much people sharing their individual stories of that day's work of how they made a difference to a customer's life you know which actually then connected them to the brand and their job whatever job that was, whether it be a waiter in the restaurant, the front doorman, the person making the beds, I think anything like that connects. At Bupa, for example, my, my previous organization I worked for, I used to visit some of those dementia centers uh, and deal with aged care staff in terms of what they do to actually bring that person to life of every day, uh, longer, healthy, happier lives and making a difference for both residents and their families. And at Close Brothers, I guess, you know, with the pandemic uh, as a, um, a player in the financial services sector, lending, supporting customers and businesses through the cycle uh, over the long term, helping their businesses thrive, grow and sustain uh, through expertise and long relationships. For me, that's what purpose is really about. It's how you bring that to life every day. Uh, there's nothing worse for me than having a purpose state in a wall and actually not living up to it. Uh, then a promise doesn't become a promise, it just becomes a nice slogan. Yeah. Uh, so for me, that's the most critical thing of how you bring purpose to every touch point, every interaction, uh, and making people feel part that they can contribute to that purpose daily in their, jo their jobs, really. And do you think organisations struggle with that, bringing that brand and purpose together? You know, in your experience, is that easy, difficult to do? No, of course, uh, in day-to-day -day businesses, when you have trade-off decisions to make, sometimes those things can become a challenge, right, in terms of the pressure to delivering financial results, mm -hmm. the pressures of driving efficiency improvements, how do you ensure you're actually still doing that with a mindset of delivering on your wider purpose, which in our instance is making the business of and customers of the UK thrive and survive over the long term? How do we actually do that day to day in our decision making? So I think, you know, ultimately 
Um, therefore, you need to have the ingredients in place to make sure you bring the customer and your purpose front and centre of the decision making processes in the organisation to ensure it is front and centre when we, you start to make those choices and decision making challenges. Um, and I think then see, as a CX leader, I think it's also challenging organisations when we don't do the right thing. So I think ultimately there are times when perhaps we have made the wrong mistake or any organisation makes, makes a mistake and perhaps hasn't delivered what it said it would. And I think having the, uh, the, the gravitas and the confidence to stand up and say, actually, we didn't do the right thing here. We need to actually change what we did. Uh, I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's about, you know, the whole organisation just holding that mirror up and saying, actually, you know, we, we weren't our best selves in that situation. We've let the customer down. It's OK. But together, how are we going to really step forward and make sure we do better next time? Really? Yeah, and I wouldn't just limit that to, to customer. I think, you know, when I talk about customer experience, I think that matters in terms of how our brand stacks up, really, for example, in terms of the reputation of our brand and our business versus our competitors and clearly you know if we do what we said we would do and reinforce our brand values and our purpose day by day that reinforces our reputation uh, at a brand level. I think it also matters in terms of product in terms of our product you know are our products uh, and the experiences around our products uh, fit for purpose and are they being brought to life in the right way for customers and for our people ultimately so ultimately you can't build a great business if you haven't got people and deliver great people experiences and making sure your people feel uh, connected to your brand, give discretionary effort, because if you don't deliver that, your, your people probably will not deliver a great experience and they will have an adverse effect on your brand performance and brand image. So it all has to work together as one. So the brand, the product, the customer and the employee be feeling connected to the overall purpose uh, of the organisation and values of the organisation. So let's focus on the kind of financial services industry mm. um, and I guess historically you know there's been a huge reliance in that sector around face-to-face -face relationships um, and having that in-person contact mm -hmm. with customers. In your experience you know how, how has that kind of had to evolve and how has that change mm. come about really in terms of digitalization mm -hmm. and you know having the hybrid or actually moving away from you know, limiting the, the amount of face-to-face -face contact altogether within that relationship management kind of cycle, really? Well, I think the first thing I would say, I have to be very careful around that. I think what made a company great uh, and the success of the organisation, if it's based in a relationship industry, which our business is, um, then I wouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater too quickly. So I think you have to be very sensitive as to where digitalisation makes sense in the context of a relationship business which has been successful in terms of delivering great experience, delivering value, delivering trust, delivering reputation and growth through those relationships. So I think sensitively doing it is quite important. Uh, I think the, the other thing I would say is dissecting forensically the, the, the customer uh, journey end to end, understanding which points in that journey actually do lend itself to digitalization. And I would, say, I would say it's about enhancing those journeys rather than replacing. So I would say so how you augment what you have rather than replace uh, and actually utilize digital opportunity as a way to enhance what you do rather than actually you know, remove what's there. So I think, um, I think it's also about bringing the people with you. Uh, it's about change, around how you man manage that change, any change in how you do business, uh, both internally and externally with your people, partners or clients has to be managed in a sensitive way. So I think how you involve the right people to actually support that transformation uh, is critical uh, in terms of making sure we can get all views uh, and, and understand where the opportunities might lie, um, where we can actually capitalize, and utilize digitalization uh, tools to actually help us uh, accelerate what we do. Yeah, I'm thinking of customer journey specifically. You know, how have you gone about deciding within those journeys which require the human element versus can be purely digital and then also deciding which ones can have a blend of human and digitalization how do you go about deciding um, which you know kind of are human versus digital but then how do you ensure that the ones that have a hybrid actually are customer centric and feel quite seamless for your customers hmm. well i think i think there are a number of uh, steps involved in that. I think the first thing I've mentioned uh, earlier is 
walk in the shoes of your customers, right? So actually uh, unpacking the customer journey end to end mm -hmm. across all touch points and all moments of truth is the first step. Uh, and also understanding how that journey feels uh, for each customer segment you have. Uh, so I think the first thing is mapping and understanding the as is customer journey from a customer point of view. Um, and of course, understanding what the needs of customers are throughout that journey and where could there be opportunities to make things more simple, uh, more easy, uh, and where therefore digital can play a role to actually uh, simplify and enhance those journeys. So I think that's the first thing in terms of mapping out the journeys, understanding where we can actually add value from a digital perspective, uh, and then identify what those opportunities are. The second thing then for me would be about uh, making sure you get the right team involved, you know, an agile team who can actually start to look at those opportunities in more depth. Uh, be, don't be afraid of sort of test and learn approaches, take baby steps uh, and to start to um, learn from that. Uh, and once you've done the learnings, worked out how, how things can operate, look to scale those. And the final thing would it be how you manage those and govern those journeys uh, end to end. So I think, you know, digital touch points and or blended experience in a customer journey need to be managed correctly and governed correctly. So I'm the right accountability and ownership each journey stage, I think is important to understand how you continue to evolve those journeys, drive continuous improvement and making sure the performance of them is in line with what you expect. So I think it's an element of walking in the shoes, the design process, test and learn and scale and then governance and accountability for, for those journeys when you operationalize them. And how much of, of all of that do you kind of rely on technology or data to help oversee all of those steps that you just called out? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, data fundamentally or insight, I would say more broadly, is the, 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 the crux of all that because, as I said, in terms of designing anything, you need to understand mm -hmm. uh, what, the, um, what the data is telling you, what our customers insights are telling us in terms of how we might go about something. Mm -hmm. uh, then the data flows clearly are important then to, to manage throughout to ensure you can, you can actually understand what's going right and what's going wrong. So a the insight in the first place to actually uh, help the design process uh, and secondly ensuring you have the data and insight coming from the touch points and the journey stages to manage the experience uh, are critical elements of ensuring you design and deliver effective journey management. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you, in your experience, how have you involved customers within that design thinking yeah. and kind of test and learn? Yeah, I would, I would say um, across different industries that is at different stages of, of maturity, I would say, in terms of our customers actively involved in those processes of a test and learn, the design process itself. Um, I actively would say, you know, that's an important critical part, you know, ultimately they're, they're the ones who ultimately experience the outcome of what you're designing. So involvement in the, uh, in all phases will be critical to ensure something lands well and is fit for purpose. Um, but I think there's still a lot of work to do in many organizations of how they bring customers into the right stage. Uh, whilst they're designing their agile processes and agile digital um, ways of working and tools to actually involve in the right stage for feedback uh, and piloting. Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, we've talked about this in other of the CX podcasts where you know, um, organisations have had labs. So they've had intentional space you know, within their head office mm -hmm. or within their customer teams where they can actually bring in customers into the physical brick and mortar space mm -hmm. to get involved at the right touch point. Have, have you seen that in organizations that you've worked for and can you bring to life you know, how the success has been reached by doing that type of approach? Yeah, I think you have to be careful. I think customer labs, uh, you know, we, we, we've had uh, those in, in, in previous organizations I work for. And I think having a safe environment where you can test and learn prototype and bring customers, iterate what you're doing uh, real time, um, clearly helps in terms of creating something which is stick, which sticks and is fit for, fit for purpose. So I think uh, that that can help. I think the caution I would have is, you know, making sure you you involve the right people in your own business to ensure when those things become scalable, you don't just put them back into the operations and expect them to be used. So I think it's really important to, you, to manage the change around that, 
to really making sure those things get operationally embedded uh, across the business correctly. So I think customer labs, labs do have a place. I think definitely the, the, the role of um, involving customers at the right stage is critical in the test and learn process, both the start in terms of insight and as you develop, um, but also ensuring you have the right team in place in the first place to ensure that when we all come to operationalize, those things get, can, can, uh, can stick in the organization. Yeah, I agree. And, and earlier you talked about, in terms of skill sets in order to deliver, mm this brand and kind of customer purpose combined. You talked about agility and having agile kind of ways of working. What are typically are the kind of skill sets that you've seen where successful organizations deliver, you know, that customer centricity? What are the skills that they have and what's the makeup of that in the organization that enable them to deliver that digital customer experience? Well, I think, you know, you have to democratize the skills in the organization. Many organizations still have centers of expertise, centers of competence, which are, you've got highly skilled customer experience people in those with lots of backgrounds in agile ways of working, insight, uh, journey mapping, journey design, uh, design thinking. But my, my experience, you know, to drive customer centric change across large organizations, mm -hmm. that can't be done with a small center of expertise, center of competence, that's to be democratized across the organization. Um, in my a previous organization, we created what we call our design tribe to actually have something like two and a half thousand service designers across the organization. And they sat within teams and units uh, and were able to support all those innovation and, and, and uh, development processes. So they sat within teams, they were called upon and utilized for, for, for agile sprint work, uh, creating things like digital garages where we actually had uh, scrum teams being formed very quickly uh, with the right expertise in terms of facilitation uh, and having the right tool set to guide people through design processes um, and in therefore having a better chance of success when those things become operationalized. So I think, yes, you have, some, have to have some core skills, then you have to invest in capability building across the organization and democratize that across the organization if you want to re be really truly customer centric. Thinking back to brand and purpose and mm. aligning those two things, how have you seen organizations approach kind of culturally getting that buy-in across the organization? So earlier you talked about how important it was mm. that people understood where they fit into that brand purpose, you know, and the role they play within that. But how do you do that culturally? How have you seen organizations mm -hmm. kind of really get the buy-in of the people mm -hmm. to kind of drive that purpose and brand and customer experience forward? No, it's, it's a very good question. I think the reality is that's not an easy thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a daily job uh, of, of leaders in the organization to reinforce the purpose. Um, and I, I've just given you an example earlier on with, with the uh, with the example of Ritz Carlton, where actually that was being com that conversation happened every day of the week, in every hotel. You know, the reality is having a conversation. What have you done today, which has brought that purpose to life? How can we celebrate those who've done a great job and story told around that? So, it's constant reinforcement, constant communication, making sure that you pick out uh, highlights where people have done a fantastic job. People get coached to how they might learn from others who've done those fantastic jobs to bring that for life. And I think also it's about bringing that uh, lens into the right forums. I mentioned earlier on that having, for example, the right customer forum set up where when it comes to decision makings on how we prioritize our change agenda, you know, that's done through the lens of are we ensuring the change we make in enhance and contribute to our purpose and brand values in fact detract from it so I think it's the hard stuff in terms of getting the right uh, things in place when you're having uh, those conversations to make sure you have that lens in place first and foremost and secondly from a cultural perspective I think it's an element of uh, bringing that to, to, to life from a leadership perspective day in day out and probably the third thing I would say is um, when um, people get on board in organizations from the start uh, I think it's really important that organizations talk around what that business is there to do, what do they stand for, what their role is, etc. Um, so that's really you know, embedded from day one of, of, of the person joining an organization. So Andrew, let's go back to how 
relationships mm. have evolved in the financial services kind mm-hmm. of industry. Mm-hmm. Just want to bring to life some more examples for the listeners around things that happen from an experiential perspective in the bricks and mortar that are now 100% digitalized. Yeah, look, well, I, I think um, just to reinforce, I think at, at close, you know, human ce- human centric uh, culture is still critical. Relationships are still absolutely front and center of our business. They have been, they are, and they continue to will be. Um, um, I think then, so we really talk about human centric and digitally enabled, right? So I think we want to remain human centric. We want to remain people in relationship focused. That's the core of our business. Mm-hmm. But we also want to embrace how we utilize digitalization to enable our people, enable our customers to do things better, smarter, and more efficiently. So I think, as I mentioned earlier, we want to unpack those uh, customer experiences end to end and identify what those touch points might be, which are irritants or problems where we can actually, customers don't actually necessarily need to ring us. They don't need to contact us. It's actually just hassle and actually adds complexity. Uh, it takes longer and actually um, it's, it's not as convenient for the customer. So I think there are definitely touch points in any business in financial services uh, where you know we can digitalize those things so I think in the past Amazon used to have this full box model you know in terms of saying you know what are those touch points where there's no value add for the customer unlimited value add for the organization so either re-engineer those touch points out or make it easier for customers to get those things done without having to contact somebody so I think they're the opportunities where I think automation digitalization can have the biggest impact in the short term so high volume transactions, uh, transactions which um, no, have had no real value to the customer, which just caused pain. Um, we can make those simple and easy to do by deploying digital assets and automation to do that. I think when things become more complex, you know, we still need to ensure we have that human, human face. Uh, and I think that's what, like the, the blend of that experience, I think is gonna be the most critical thing. Um, I saw a recent uh, re- report um, um, on, on something called the autonomous customer. We think channel choice is still going to be important. So I think to offer customers the opportunity to, to deal with this in different ways is still going to be critical. I think clearly on those um, high volume touch points, which are, you know, we can we can make quicker and easier. I think they, that's where, we, where the bigger biggest opportunities are. I think the other thing uh, on B2B um, is how we deploy digital tools to enable our, our salespeople, our account people to actually do their jobs easier is also important, right? So I wouldn't just say digitalization is a customer only uh, opportunity. It's also a way we can equip and enable our employees to focus their time on where they can have the most value and take out from their day-to-day work the things which actually cause a lot of pain uh, and take a lot of time. And we can make those things easier. Uh, in the day-to-day work, whether it be for account planning tools, having access to data, having access to dashboards, having access to customer information, which can be more presented to the customer easily without not rather having to try to pull that together yourself in a manual way. Those things just make that job a hell of a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely, and, and employee NPS is becoming now a mm-hmm. key KPI you know, on those exec dashboards, because mm-hmm. actually, you know, happy employees, happy customer, um, and those efficiencies, you know, that you talk through digitalization there actually give better experience for the employee and the customer. So it's win-win, you know, all around in terms of, you know, the experiences. How have you found kind of in your experience the employee journey around adopting from that traditional relationship management bricks and mortar to digitalization yeah. what's that journey been like well like i think i think any change in working practice uh, has to be managed correctly it's a change management topic more than anything else uh, and it's about people uh, trying to change their day-to-day behaviors of how they go about doing their work so the reality is uh, i think i mentioned earlier on that you, you want people to feel engaged when you're actually uh, going for that digitalization process um, so they don't fear that, they actually feel this is going to help them be more effective in their jobs. Mm-hmm. So I think embracing people as you go through uh, that change is really important, how you involve people so they don't fear that, but they can actually see how it advances and, and uh, augments what they do. Um, 
but of course, you know, winning hearts and minds is, is not easy. It can't be done overnight. So we need lots of training, uh, lots of support, coaching, communication. Um, so I, I would embrace that as a bit of a, a change project in itself of how you embed new ways of working, embed the use of new tools in day-to-day -day work is much about a people and change journey as it is a technology journey actually. Yeah. And going back to customer, having gone through that kind of a, you know journey of figuring out which um, experiences are either purely digital, bricks and mortar or the hybrid, how have your customers responded? What kind of feedback are you getting from your customers, you know, around how it feels, you know, to deal with your current organisation or experience in the past, really, of where, you know, are customers embracing it? What, you know, what's the general consensus? Yeah, I, I think, as I think I mentioned earlier on, that the reality is you always have to put in place, um, from from a governance perspective, the, the, the listening post to ensure you're always always listening to your customers, being always on effectively in terms of listening to your customers at your, at your key touch points and key journey stages, uh, and understanding are there things we're deploying working or not. So I think that's the third thing you have to have the ingredients first of all to listen to customers and have the accountability that actually somebody's owning that feedback and actually doing something with it to turn the action uh, to to improve things. So. Um, I would say, you know, given where we were with the pandemic, you know, there's certainly, I would say, uh, been a shift across many brands, of course, and the acceptance, therefore, of utilisation of digital tools, uh, which probably companies may not have been um, reticent, pretty reticent around rolling out too quickly. So I think there's been a gradual embracement of utilisation of digital channels. However, as I said, the recent research I saw was uh, you know, um, channel choice is still important and offering different ways to contact an organisation is still critical, especially when it comes to, to more challenging conversations or difficult, stressful conversations or needs, which really where you need emotional intelligence. Uh, it's probably better speaking to a human for those things. Um, so I, 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 th I think that will still remain the sort of hybrid world we're living in. I think, you know, uh, I think there's, there's definitely a, a, an acceleration in embracing, I would say, uh, digital tools, uh, chat, uh, artificial intelligence opportunities for high volume, simple transactions, because it just simply makes life easier and you can get things done quicker, which actually, you know, is a great thing. Uh, and then hopefully we've created some more capacity to actually spend more time with customers and things which really matter to them where we can actually have more deeper conversations will help in their daily lives. And that, I guess, goes back to the heartland of financial services, wanting to have those relationships, removing the contacts that are transactional and are not value-add, just allows you to do that, whether that's in a different channel, it doesn't matter, it's just creating the space to be able to continue to do that, which is so important, you know, you described that as an important kind of value for close um, yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, I, you know, I, I think our, our view is we want to remain human-centric, people-centric and relationship-centric, but we want to be digitally enabled. And, you know, there, there, are, there will be growing opportunities to become more digitally enabled uh, as we, uh, in the future and today, you know, some of that work is accelerating, especially on those high volume transactional touch points, which we can either remove altogether or make it much easier to do business with, um, make things simple and easier. Um, so I think that's the journey which a lot of organisations are on. Um, then I would say the other important thing is how we create the interplay between the digital world, world and the human world. So everybody talks about seamless omni-channel experience, which is a nice buzzword, but very difficult to get right. So how does that fit together seamlessly uh, is going to be a critical uh, success factor, I think, for, for all organisations. Um, so I think management of that, the transition from digital to human, human to digital in a seamless integrated way and joined up way is probably where the challenge is for a lot of brands and organizations to make that work. Going back to your point around the channels, um, you know, again, I read recently around, you know, organizations almost wanting to make the, the telephony, the phones, voice channel obsolete. And I think, you know, maybe 18 months, two years ago, that was almost, you know, a, a mission for lots of organisations. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, mm -hmm. I agree with you, as you said earlier, you know, it, it may not be necessary, but that choice, I think, is, is essential. And, you know, I've been working with companies just over the last couple of weeks where some have 
clear feedback from customers that they want to interact digitally and that's the primary channel. Mm -hmm. They don't want to ever have to talk to someone on, on, you know, in a voice channel. But then speaking to someone today, polar opposite, actually their customers preferred voice and that was the primary channel. So, you know, totally agree that the choice is what's important mm -hmm. and organisations not making any assumptions and doing necessarily what's right for the firm. It's about making sure that the customer is involved in that decision making as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, as I said, you know, walking in the shoes of the customers is, is a phrase I use a lot, but I think ultimately it's about that, right? So, and of course, the customers you serve are different per business, uh, and we're in obviously in different industries, how people want to interact with you. So, you know, I can imagine still in a relationship business, especially with partners and our distributors, they'll still want to engage primarily face to face, but there will be opportunities to digitize certain elements or transactions. Um, and of course, there'll be other customers who, you know, you mentioned earlier on, who, who may struggle to utilize some of those digital assets yeah. and tools who, who we need to support in different ways. So I think you, we can always have to deal with that sort of mix of channels uh, and how we manage customers across that um, is going to be a, a key capability and skill set for organizations. Yeah. That brings me on nicely, actually, to vulnerable customers, mm -hmm. you know, which is a term that's out there now, mm -hmm. especially. You know, what do we mean by that? So these are customers that can't access the internet, mm. that um, you know, don't have a computer maybe, mm. um, and where you know, firms are moving to digitalizing information or communication, mm -hmm. but actually you've got customer groups that just can't access that. Mm -hmm. So you know, as I said at the start, you know, perceived mm -hmm. as being disadvantaged. As a CX leader, you know, in your experience, how, how does a firm you know, really kind of approach identifying managing and supporting those kind of vulnerable yeah. customer groups? Well, I, I think you, you hit the nail, actually identifying who's vulnerable um, in the first place uh, is a pretty important start. So understanding who in your customers has some vulnerability, whatever form that is, because uh, that changes over time. As we know, uh, vulnerability uh, changes um, in the moment um, and at different stages in the person's life. We under, need to understand who's vulnerable and at which points time they're vulnerable and why they're vulnerable. And I think you know, we can use analytics and David and, and, and sentiment analysis and so on to, to do some of that, to be able to be a bit more proactive and understanding who might require different levels of support. And I think that the second thing is about understanding what the needs are. So not all vulnerable, you know, uh, have a problem with technology. So there'll be elements of that vulnerable segment who clearly might need to interact with this in different ways. And I think therefore we need to understand those needs quite, quite deeply uh, and therefore be able to then understand how we design and deliver our journeys in a way which meets those needs. Um, the other thing I would say around that is, it is it's, it's really then equipping your agents uh, with emotional intelligence to, to identify people who may require different support uh, and ensuring that we have triage process in place to make sure we uh, provide that support as and when required. So. Technology is a role to play in terms of helping identify. I think design of processes, design of journeys to meet those needs is critical. Uh, having the right uh, coaching of the front line to ensure they have the emotional uh, cues to be able to understand where vulnerability is existing, how we support that. And then that's commit and that commitment from leadership top down in terms of that's an important thing for business to, to, to deal with. I think all those factors are, are critical elements uh, here, really. In your experience, what is the greatest kind of challenge that you see organisations and firms have to overcome digitalising customer experience? Yeah, I think um, um, I think I mentioned earlier on. I, I don't see it so much as a technology challenge. I see it as a people challenge to, to a large extent. You know, either in terms of your internal. Um, employee embracing the need uh, and requirement to change how we work. Uh, so that's a challenge in itself of how you get people on board the bus uh, and feeling that we're actually doing something with them rather than to them uh, and of course dealing with the fears and anxiety which may come from that. So I think clearly there's, there's you know, a challenge in society at, at large in terms of potential job displacement as a result of digitalization. So I think this, those fears exist and are real. So how we deal with that um, is important um, in, in a very human way. Um, 
The second thing I would say how you approach it is um, making sure um, you have the right capabilities in place to, to manage those things correctly. So I mentioned earlier on having um, uh, d design thinking leaders, agile ability in your organization, creating the right teams of people who can co-create uh, and test and learn and, 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 and um, innovate is quite important. Um, so how you go about doing that, I think you know there are different, uh, different ways and I think companies have, have trialled those big digital garages uh, and created separate businesses outside the normal business and then try to deploy those things back into the operations. You know, my own view around that is I, I would rather, I, I, I think it works better if you involve people from day one, uh, involve the right people because they feel for, therefore probably feel a bit more encouraged to utilise those things later on when they become, uh, become deployed operationally um, in the line. Um, so it's about uh, having the right capabilities of the right team, uh, dealing with the emotion, involving the people, communication, don't be afraid to fail. Uh, it's all about testing and learn. Some things will work, some things won't work. Iterating around that, so making sure you get constant feedback. And when we deploy things, we can actually learn quickly and change quickly. I think that's really important. Um, and then um, making sure you've got the right uh, accountability and governance when those things do, de do, de do get deployed, where you've got people who can own those things end to end um, with the right dashboards and performance metrics. So Andrew, you've worked in customer experience for a long time. You've got a huge amount of experience in this space. What keeps you motivated to kind of go into bat for the customer? Well, you know, I think um, I, I started off this conversation by saying uh, sustainable growth depends on the relationships we have or don't have with our customers, ultimately. So A, I'm really passionate around helping companies grow and doing the right things for customers, because I think doing the right things for customers actually helps you to grow in a natural way to terms of driving net, net customer growth, etc. Um, and I'm also passionate about working with customers who really want to, you know, put purpose uh, and, and their values at the centre of the organisation and bring those to life, really, because I think that, that's just a great thing to, do, to, to be, really. I think, um, you know, if we ask about Fred Reichel when he started his NPS stuff off and you know, how he came to that conclusion, it was very simple, right? So. If you serve customers really well, do a great job for them, they'll come back and they'll tell their friends to actually want to, as well about doing business with you, right? So, you know, that's quite an easy and natural thing to understand, right? So, if you do a great job for customers, they'll come back for more, they'll retain their business with you, they'll tell their friends and family you are great to do business with, and they may want to come and do work, uh, business with you as well. And ultimately, you'll help grow your business over time uh, and at the same time have fun along the way. So I think that for me is, is, is you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about in 15 years and with various brands in, in financial services, healthcare, utilities. Um, and I think, still think there's opportunities to, to do more. Um, many companies are still struggling uh, doing those things. Um, and I think there's still a long way for go, to go for companies to be truly customer centric. Another buzzword, right? Customer centricity and customer centric. Yeah. And I think it's definitely on a lot of execs kind of wish lists. Have you, have you noticed um, through the pandemic and just in the last kind of 18 months really that it feels like some organisations have used it as an excuse to, to, to not deliver a great customer experience? Yeah, I think um, I read a piece of research recently where I, I think that's true. I, I would say that um, when customers, customers have been very frustrated right by calls into wait times uh, people utilising the pandemic, COVID, uh, but I think people's memories are, are, are long uh, and that, um, you know, those excuses will no longer be able to be given. Um, so, and of course, the, 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 the expectations of customers are continuing to evolve, right? So, you know, ultimately to, to win and grow in your markets uh, really does depend on, 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 on does depend on having your customers' best interests in mind. I don't believe in most businesses you can't grow profitably, sustainably over time if you don't do the right things for customers. What are your key predictions then in the future for kind of uh, customer experience? What what's what's coming? What's what innovations coming, or what's the focus mm. going to be around customer experience mm. in the headwinds? Really? Yeah. Well, look, I, I would say you know. Um, 
experience management uh, is much broader than just the customer. So I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's about delivering a great brand experience. So how does your brand uh, stack up versus the competition? And how do you continue to earn the reputation and trust of customers and stakeholders? I think that's going to be really important, um, especially we think about sustainability agendas, uh, diversity and inclusion agendas. How do we ensure your brand stacks up and cuts the mustard versus best in class uh, and you will be a company which people want to do business with. Second thing, your products, you know, are they going to be fair value uh, and deliver um, in line with the expectations of customers? Are you designing those products today for the needs of customers for today and tomorrow? Do they stack up well? So the old product experience. Uh, the customer experience is really for me about the touch points and the journeys of how you continue to evolve and improve those with the right uh, ownership around those things uh, in place. And the employee we touched on earlier on, I think ultimately, you know, as, as you said, you know, people who love your company, give discretionary effort, want to stay with you and do a great job for customers. Those employees who feel you know, disconnected, don't feel supported, perhaps do not give those level of discretionary efforts. So I think the employee experience is also important uh, going forward for, for organizations. I think the use of data and predictive analytics uh, is going to be critical. I think, you know, there's an element of survey fatigue. You know, everybody's asking, you know, survey questions. So how do we get insight uh, from uh, unstructured data? And how do we use that insight to drive action? I think that's going to be a really important area for us. And the other thing I would say, if we want to tackle some of the big societal challenges we have, we have to think beyond just our organization. So we're coming clearly from, from, from the recent um, uh, sustainability uh, debate um, and, um, I think if we want to tackle some of the biggest challenges the world is facing, we're going to have to think about how we join up uh, organizations in partnerships. So how does experience need to evolve, not only with your own business, but across the, the partnership ecosystem. So I think they're the key challenges, I think, which will be important. Uh, and I think the final one probably is, which I think there's a lot of work to be, and it's not a new topic, but I, I still think that many customer experience uh, uh, leaders uh, and teams trying to get their customer uh, priorities um, um, in, in, the, in line for, for action is still a challenge because they haven't got the business cases attached to them. So demonstrating the value of CX in terms of how does it drive retention? How does it drive um, cross and upselling? And how does it drive positive referrals and positive word of mouth? And quantifying that value in terms of customer lifetime value and the impact of that on business performance is still a challenge, I think, for many organisations. So I still think that's something which needs to be tackled. Thank you, Andrew. Lots of great insight there. Yeah. I guess I'd close with one final question for our listeners today. What would be your one piece of advice that you would give them in terms of, you know, kind of how to approach digitalising customer experience? Well, you know, I think in terms of my advice, it would be it's about customer first, not digital first. Always walk in the shoes of your customers and partners and figure out what they want for today and tomorrow. That is the secret ingredient. Thank you, Andrew. Cheers.